The Battle of Guilford Courthouse is a great specimen of 18th century combat. At Guilford, we have examples of every typical scenario of combat you would have seen in this era. Cavalry versus cavalry, cavalry versus infantry, infantry and artillery engaged in long-range firefights, and close combat. We are going to look at the way the armies of this era fought, using examples from the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, and hopefully gain a better understanding of their weapons, tactics, and procedures. The first action of the day was about four miles west of the main battlefield near the Quaker New Garden Meeting House. In an era when cavalry typically made up 20 to 30 percent of an army, both armies struggled to maintain significant cavalry forces during the Revolution. At Guilford, cavalry made up less than 10 percent of all the combatants. Part of the reason for this low number at Guilford is that we are looking at two armies isolated in the backcountry. But throughout this war, both armies struggled to maintain large bodies of cavalry, mainly for logistical reasons. Whether struggling to feed them, or in the case of the British, struggling to safely transport large bodies of cavalry in ships, neither side achieved the major cavalry forces that would have been typical of European warfare. Cavalry of the Revolution typically took on the roles of dragoons and light cavalry. They were mainly employed scouting and skirmishing gathering intel, and engaging the enemy to discern where he was and what he was doing, or fighting the enemy to delay him and serve as a warning alarm for the main body of the army. At Guilford Courthouse, that is what we see Lee and Tarleton doing in the morning. Lee's men, supported by light infantry and riflemen, are keeping an eye on the British, sending reports back to Green, and then skirmishing with the British to slow them down, but also determine where they are going and in what strength. Charlton's men are the advanced forces of the British Army. They are leading the way, seeking out where the American Army is, and also serving as a guard against ambush. The main body at daybreak marched towards the enemy's camp. The cavalry, the light infantry of the guards, and the Jaegers composed the advance guard. The British had proceeded seven miles on the Great Salisbury Road to Guilford when the light troops drove in a picket of the enemy. A sharp conflict ensued between the advanced parties of the two armies. When cavalry engage in combat, they have several different potential weapons they can use. Carbines are common to dragoons, but pistols and sabers are ubiquitous amongst all cavalry, and what we see referenced the most when referring to combat while mounted. On the table here, I have a few examples of these weapons. This is that carbine. Essentially, it's kind of a shortened infantry musket. We'll talk more about how the muskets function and what their accuracy is when we get to the infantry weapons, but I just wanted to point out to show you how short it is, as well as the fact that this particular example has a bar on the side with a ring connecting to a harness that would go around the rider. So if he needs to drop the weapon for any reason, it'll stay right with him. Now up here I have examples of a pistol and a saber. We'll start with a pistol. And both of these weapons are actually short distance weapons. A pistol ideally is going to be used within 10 yards. It's just like a musket. It's loaded at the muzzle. Take up your ramrod, pack down the charge, and then the weapon is ready to fire. And the weapon I have right here is a cavalry saber. Over three feet long, with a curved blade, this is an ideal weapon for slashing and hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's the way cavalry fought. They want to get up close, fire with their pistols, slash with their sabers, knock men down with their horses, and then ride away quickly before their enemy can have any chance to get some sort of a concerted counterattack. But at Newgarden that morning, we have an example of cavalry versus cavalry action. When Tarleton pursues Lee up the Newgarden Road, and Lee's men suddenly turned to meet him. Lee ordered the column to retire by troops. The British pressed upon the rear. The enemy emptied their pistols and then, raising a shout, pushed. At this moment, Lee ordering a charge, the dragoons came instantly to the right about and in close column rushed upon the foe, in a long lane with very high curved fences on each side of the road. The whole of the enemy's section was dismounted and many of the horses prostrated. Some of the dragoons killed, the rest made prisoners. Not a single American soldier or horse injured. Tarleton retired with celerity. As Lee, with his column in full speed, got up to the meeting house, the British guards had just reached it and gave the American cavalry a close and general fire. Lee's legion had used a narrow lane to prevent the British cavalry from being able to spread out. Tarleton tried to order his men back, but the section that was closest to Lee was too far gone and they are the ones that were unhorsed and routed by the rebel cavalry. The fighting around Newgarden transitioned into a fight between the light infantry and riflemen on both sides. 
Lee pulled his men back to return to Greene's main force. Their job had been to find the British and figure out where they were going. They now had all the proof they needed to confirm that the British Army was pushing towards Greene's position.